Welcome to The Quiet Truth, where lay Catholics work to prevent the one-parent family. I'm Tom Borak with today's episode, The One-Parent Family, Reducing the Risk. In our last episode, we finished up our explanation as to why the single-parent family is always a tragedy. We noted that it's particularly tragic for Catholic families who are trying to raise faith-filled children who are capable of swimming against the cultural current. We also identified the root cause of the explosion in the number of single-parent families. Sin. Unnatural, foolish, immature, selfish behavior. Sin that hurts men and women and children and everyone around them, and that's deeply offensive to our God. Let's get comfortable identifying these behaviors, beginning with sex before marriage, premarital sex. People like to say that premarital sex hurts no one. They'll defend it on the basis that, uh, well, they use birth control, and birth control, after all, doesn't fail. I sometimes wonder whether these people are aliens or time travelers who come from some place or time when birth control never fails. But every time I check it out, I find that they are just ordinary, contemporary earthlings who choose to believe that birth control always works, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Now, of course, at some time in the future, science may develop birth control that's 100% effective, that doesn't lead to cancer, and that is not abortifacient. But even if they do that, premarital sex will still be wrong. Premarital sex will still be sinful. Because it turns out that man's technology cannot transform vice into virtue. Extramarital sex also puts children at risk, also risks breaking up the family. And people will defend it. They will say, the heart just goes where it will. Or they will say, it just happened. I have a theory, and I think my theory is firmly grounded on the truths of the one true church, and here it is. I think these parents who make these statements, I think they started out by looking around and looking to see if they could find more attractive romantic or sexual partners. And then they began to fantasize about having a relationship with somebody else. Then they begin talking to other people that they find attractive. And if they feel some spark, some response from the other person, well, then they're interested. Then they're excited. And they continue to pursue that. And at some point down the road, they say, the heart just goes where it will. It just happened. But it didn't just happen. It happened because they gave in to the near occasions of sin. If you don't want to gamble, stay out of the casino. If you don't want to sin, avoid its near occasions. Imagine that you're a rich, powerful man. You have such willpower that you are able to transform yourself into a world-class athlete and that you use your brains and your people skills to rise to one of the highest elective offices in the land, let's say the the governor of of a big state, maybe New York or California, can you be trusted alone with the babysitter? The answer is certainly no. Even if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, you're still putty in the hands of sin. You must avoid its near occasions or it will get you. Let's consider some other spousal sins, and they are, in fact, innumerable. How about disrespecting, being rude or cold or distant to your partner because of appearance issues, housekeeping issues, financial issues, or because of the health of the uh, the other spouse? What about a spouse being irritable or angry because they're, they're tired, they're frustrated, or they're scared? How about deliberately irritating your spouse or your child? Well, I should be able to do that. No reason not to. Yeah, there is a reason not to. It's a near occasion of sin, and it's a sin in itself. How about just sitting around and wishing that you had never been married or that you had married someone else? Or how about wishing that you didn't have your children or you had different children or you didn't have to take care of your children? People who break up their their families will obtain a secular divorce. Now, a hundred years ago, a spouse seeking such a divorce had to prove to the court that he or she was the innocent victim of some very bad behavior on the part of the other person. So divorces were based upon a finding of fault. 
More recently, we have what we call no-fault divorce. The government doesn't care whether both parties are at fault or whether neither party was at fault. You basically apply for it and you get a divorce. Now, Max, if he decides to leave his family, is likely to justify his decision in part by saying that the government approved the decision. He will say, I was entitled to a divorce. The government decided that I should get a divorce. The government decided what my obligation was to my family. So if I pay my court-ordered child support, I have met all of my obligations. I have not sinned. This is, of course, the wrong standard. It's never a good idea to judge the morality of our behavior by the standards set by the government. That's been true since there have been governments. It was the government that chose to release Barabbas and to crucify Christ. They're really not good judges of what's moral. And it's true. The government will not force parents to care for their children, and it will not force spouses to remain together and fight for their marriages. It certainly can't force people to, uh, to love each other and to follow the will of God. So, in order to convince me, in order to convince a thinking Catholic who believes in the truth that the decision to leave the family is justified, Max can't point to the government to justify it. Now, of course, there are some justifications for moving away or forcing a parent out of a home. If one spouse is trying to kill the other or, or kill the children or is guilty of really serious uh, physical or mental abuse of the other party, or if one spouse decides to invite a lover to share their bedroom within the marital home, these are all reasons that could justify a separation. But even with that separation, there's, there remains the obligation on the part of both parents to work to see if there's any way to salvage that relationship and preserve that two-parent home. You don't just get a, a get-out-of-jail-free card that allows you to leave. Now, furthermore, these extreme situations are sometimes used to justify no-fault divorce. These are not the reasons why we have an epidemic of one-parent and zero-parent families. These are not the reasons why so many marriages end in divorce. Marriages break up because the parents fail to follow three simple rules. Overwhelmingly, this is true, even though there may be exceptions to it. Rule number one, if you wish to have a romantic relationship, search for someone who wants a long-term permanent marital relationship. Search for someone who wants to be committed for life to parenting any children that result from the relationship. If you see James Bond or Indiana Jones or Laura Croft or any of these uh, very attractive adventure characters coming toward you and they, they seem to seem like good options, turn around and run away. If you see the bad boy or the bad girl coming, turn around and go away. Because what you want to seek in a relationship is virtue. And if you do not seek virtue and a common commitment to what marriage really means, well, then you've, you've doomed your relationship from the start. Rule number two, love first, marry second, and have sex third. Rule number three, avoid the near occasions of sin every waking hour of every day for the rest of your life. Is this boring? Old-fashioned? A recipe for loneliness? Well, Maybe it is boring if your idea of excitement is lack of commitment and changing partners all the time. Old-fashioned? Yes. It's every bit as old-fashioned as he made them male and female. A recipe for loneliness? Absolutely not. It's a recipe for a stable family, for a long-term commitment and security. It's a recipe for raising secure, happy, faith-filled children with their best possible shot at eternal salvation. Now, this advice that I'm giving you, this is uh, very counter to the messages of the secular culture. And it requires a level of maturity. It requires adult virtue, adult courage, and adult self-confidence. I don't make the rules, I just report them. Thank you for your kind attention. Mm -hmm.